Hello and welcome to the Beat Cancer Answer, brought to you by BeatCancer.org, the Center for Advancement in Cancer Education. We believe that 90% of all cancers could be eliminated through environmental and lifestyle choices alone, and science agrees. Unfortunately, most people don't know it, so we provide the education that can help you prevent, cope with, and beat cancer through diet, lifestyle, and other immune-boosting approaches. On every podcast, we will feature an expert who can teach us how to become part of that 90% who could prevent getting diagnosed with cancer. If you already have cancer, we have empowering information for you too. Over the past 35 years, we have helped thousands of cancer patients get back into the driver's seat when it comes to their personal journey of healing cancer and preventing future reoccurrence. Susan Silberstein interviews Dr. Linda Isaacs on individualized nutritional protocols for cancer. This is Susan Silberstein, and I'm very happy to have with me today Dr. Linda Isaacs. Linda Isaacs, MD, received her Bachelor of Science degree from the University of Kentucky. She graduated with high distinction with a major in biochemistry and was elected to Phi Beta Kappa. She subsequently received her medical degree from Vanderbilt University School of Medicine. She completed a residency in internal medicine at the Department of Veterans Affairs Medical Center at New York University Medical School. She is board certified in internal medicine and most recently completed recertification in 2011. Dr. Isaac worked with her colleague, Dr. Nicholas Gonzalez, for more than 20 years using a nutritional approach for treating patients diagnosed with cancer and other serious degenerative illnesses. After his untimely death in 2015, she has continued with the work that they shared. Dr. Isaacs has written papers published in peer-reviewed journals like Nutrition and Cancer and Alternative Therapies in Health and Medicine, and she is co-author of the book, The Trophoblast and the Origins of Cancer. Welcome, Dr. Isaacs. It's a privilege to be introducing you today. Well, thank you so much for having me, and I really appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. Thank you. You know, we at BeatCancer.org understand the enormous value of nutritional support for cancer patients, and I lecture about that all the time. But of course, as cancer educators and not clinicians like yourself, we can only take patients so far. And also, although informed health consumers and practitioners appreciate the value of a heavily plant-based diet, I'm always concerned about that one-size-fits-all dietary plan. And so can you explain the concept of your individualized nutritional protocols for cancer patients? Well, sure. Um, the the treatment that we've offered over the years um, does have as its underpinning the idea that not all people need the same thing. And this is based on the work of a number of other practitioners that I can certainly get into as we go along. But in a nutshell, what I would say is that um, people with certain types of cancers do do well on a more plant-based diet. People with conditions like um, uh, carcinomas in general, that would include breast cancer, colon cancer, pancreas pancreatic cancer. But we feel that there's another class of patients that actually does better with a a more carnivorous diet. Um, People with different types of problems like myeloma, uh, melanoma, the leukemias, for example. And the supplement protocols that we advise people to take are also different. Um, People that do well on a plant-based diet also do well with a lot of magnesium and potassium, not so much calcium. Um, The people on the carnivorous diet are exactly the opposite. So the type of protocol that we would give someone um, would vary depending on what kind of problem they have, and the the kind of problem they have would really depend on their underlying physiology, which can be somewhat different for different kinds of people. Fascinating. Fascinating. So um, now, as we said, for many years, you worked in partnership with Dr. Nicholas Gonzalez, who I have to say was a real pioneer in the field. And whom I was privileged to know personally and about whom I've written on our website. Can you share a little bit about the history of his metabolic approach to cancer? 
Um, sure. He actually got into this line of work um, as a medical student when he met the practitioner William Donald Kelly. And Dr. Kelly, uh, who I believe you also knew, was a mm -hmm. very brilliant man. I mean, he had started off as an orthodontist, but in his 30s, he developed a serious illness that almost certainly was pancreatic cancer. I say almost certainly because this was in the early 60s, and so there were no CAT scans, there were no needle biopsies. The only way to prove for sure what the origin of the lump sticking out of his abdomen was would have been to do surgery, which his doctors felt didn't make much sense. Um, and so they said to him uh, he was it lost enormous amounts of weight, had a tumor sticking out of his abdomen, and they told him it was probably pancreatic cancer and to get his affairs in order. Um, and he then started treating himself nutritionally with a program that was mainly plant-based, include large numbers of pancreatic enzymes, um, and also with detoxification techniques like the coffee enemas. And based on that treatment of himself, he wound up getting better. From then on, people with cancer started to come to him, and by the time Nick met him in the early 1980s, he had uh, changed from being an orthodontist to being an alternative cancer practitioner. Um, Nick had gotten interested in his work and had started on a research study reviewing large numbers of Dr. Kelly's cases. Um, Nick was partway through that at the time that I met him. I was a medical student at Vanderbilt University, and Nick was the intern on the internal medicine team that I had been assigned to do my third year rotation. So I worked with him for six weeks back at Vanderbilt. Um, it's quite, quite a long time ago now. Um, and I was very impressed by how brilliant he was, how hardworking he was. But then I found out about his research project. And he was willing to talk about his research project to anyone who would listen, and I was willing to listen. Um, and he told me about some of the cases that he'd found in Dr. Kelly's files. That's what got me interested in this work. That's how he got interested in this work, and, and things kind of moved forward from there. <laughs> well, I'm glad you were open-minded, and I'm glad Nick was open-minded, but I'm not sure everyone in conventional oncology uh, is the same. How has it been received there? Well, uh, I would say a mixed. Um, you know, Nick and I always had the goal of trying to do research in a way that would be accepted by the Orthodox community. And he and I, in a, in a funny way, we were, were he was and I am um, fairly conservative in a lot of ways, you know, but at the same time, very pragmatic and that I'm interested in what works. And I've seen too many good results with this treatment to be willing to just pack it in and, you know, go off and treat hypertension with drugs for the rest of my days. Um, <laughs> so, uh, so, but having said that, you know, we we have over the years tried to collect case reports. Um, that's kind of the first step in terms of medical research um, to collect case reports of people that have done extraordinarily well. Um, and uh, Nick was actually invited in 1993 to present cases of his at the National Cancer Institute. And based on that, uh, there were a number of people that had done extraordinarily well, even though he'd only been practicing five years at that point. And so they recommended doing a pilot study in pancreatic cancer. Now, pancreatic cancer specifically is an illness that um, is... From our point of view, it was a good one to focus our research on because the the nature of it is fairly uniformly nasty. I mean, obviously, it's very unfortunate for the patients that get it. But to study an illness like breast cancer, for example, which can vary from extremely aggressive to something that people can live with for many, many years, um, it, that can be a lot more difficult because if you get good results, people will just argue that somehow or other you selected all the people that would have done well anyway. Um, mm -hmm. With pancreatic cancer, there is no such group. And so we were able to get funding to do this pilot study. And the results were published in the journal Nutrition and Cancer in 1999. Um, what we found was that of 11 patients in this, entered into the study, nine of them survived a year. 
Um, five of them survived two years, and at the time of the publication, four um, had survived three years, and some of them at that time were still alive. So the results were way beyond um, what uh, was shown in other studies about pancreatic cancer. Um, based on that, uh, the National Cancer Institute wound up approving funding for a much larger clinical trial that was um, was administered through one of the teaching hospitals here in New York City. Um, unfortunately, that one turned into a big mess um, because we didn't have control over which patients were admitted to the study, and they wound up admitting a lot of patients that simply didn't follow through. Um, so from our point of view, the results were completely useless. Um, but from the, uh, you know, the orthodox, from the point of view of an orthodox practitioner and orthodox oncologist, you know, they, they've been trained in a certain way and they, they don't really want to believe that something like this could potentially work. Um, and so our objections to the study were kind of glossed over and, you know, here we are back to collecting case reports again. Um, but realistically, there, there are so many challenges in terms of implementing a, a formal study and a treatment such as this that, uh, you know, case reports is what I plan to do going forward. Um, and that's, that's what Nick was actually working on, a collection of such things at the time of his passing away. Right. And of course, that's certainly uh, your type of program is not going to fit with the Standard model of double-blind placebo-controlled study. You can't you can't blind a lifestyle. You can't placebo control a lifestyle. Well, that's right. And you know, one of the things that we thought was that the fact that we were doing a study would mean that um, patients, physicians, would be more supportive of their treatment choice, just on the grounds that yes, we were trying to do a formal study. But that's not the way it worked out at all. Um, and so, you know, patients dealing with a lifestyle program, um, most research studies into that sort of thing, um, they they have a very extensive support network set up so that the patients will feel supported and feel like they've made a good choice as they're implementing, you know, diet and exercise to try to deal with diabetes, for example. Um, but here, our patients were, you know, trying to implement their treatment programs, and their oncologists, their family physicians. Um, were not particularly supportive at all. Um, mm -hmm. So it was it was a very upsetting experience for both of us, uh, and mm -hmm. one that um, you know I, I think that until such time as the oncology community in general is a little more open to this concept, um, I don't think that trying to do another study at this point would have any different an outcome just because you know the the patients didn't get the support that they needed um, and that that's hard to recover from I mean, dr. Gonzalez actually wrote a, a book on the subject about the clinical trial called what went wrong so if any of your listeners are interested in hearing uh, the entire sad story in elaborate detail um, then they can certainly check out that book. I will say, though, just trying to take things to a more positive note, there was one very good thing that came out of that research study, and that was a patient of mine. Um, she had actually been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Um, she had an abnormal CAT scan in November of 2000, and a needle biopsy in February of 2001 showed that she definitely had um, adenocarcinoma, the, the, the most aggressive kind of cancer of the pancreas. And um, her condition seemed to be localized to the pancreas, um, and so they offered her surgery, but she didn't want to have surgery, and I could understand her logic. I personally believe that if a, if a cancer is operable, I think it makes sense to do that, mm -hmm. but in the case of pancreatic cancer, the procedure itself, um, the, the surgery to remove a cancer of the pancreas is not a trivial thing. Um, people can die from a result of that study. People, I mean, or that surgery, um, people uh, can wind up with long-term health problems, and it's only successful in terms of long-term cancer-free survival in 25% of the people that get it. So the majority of those who come out of the operating room and the surgeon says they've gotten it all, in fact, the cancer re re will recur and they will die of it. Mm -hmm. So this patient um, realized all of this. You know, she did her research and she decided she didn't want to have surgery. 
she heard about the clinical trial, which was in process, and she sent her records to be evaluated at the academic center that was doing the study. So they uh, encouraged her to get on a plane and come to New York to be evaluated to be in the study. And then when she got to their office, looking at the exact same records that they'd used to approve her flying across the country, they said, well, wait a minute, why aren't you getting surgery? And she said, well, I've chosen not to get it. And they told her, well, this study's only op- uh, being offered to people that can't get surgery. In other words, the fact that you can have surgery means that you should get surgery and you can't be in the study. Hmm. Um, so she came to my office for her appointment with me later that day in tears. She just didn't understand what the deal was because she felt like she should be eligible and it didn't make sense to me either. Um, so I went ahead and treated her off the protocol, you know, just giving her a program as I would you know, as anybody else that came to the office, and she is still alive. Um, she, I spoke to her last um, last December, actually, and she is doing just fine. Um, and so she is now uh, 15 years out um, with a diagnosis that should have taken her from us 15 years after. I mean, 15 months after it was made, and now mm-hmm. she's 15 years out and, wow. uh, and doing very well. So that's one good thing. I'm not sure if I would have met her or if she would have come in if she hadn't heard about the study. And she is um, still alive and living her life. Isn't that great? That's great. Well, I applaud your your determination and your commitment in the face of some clear obstacles to keep going. And I, I guess it's a case like that that helps you stay committed. Absolutely. Yes. And fortunately um, for me, you know, as I as I go along, there's always people that are doing well and people that can remind me why I do what I do. <laughs> um, you know, listening to I mean, she called me a couple of times, you know, in the, in the wake of um, of Nick passing away last year <laughs> just to check in on me. Oh, you know, isn't that wonderful when when patients love their doctors enough to care how they are. That is a wonderful thing. Yeah. Well, thank it's you. Thank you for what you do. It's wonderful to be on the receiving do. end of it, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, yes, and uh, over the many years since I met Nick um, uh, and you, I, I've referred quite a number of patients for these biochemically individualized programs. And clearly, there is a lot of intense work involved, both on the part of the doctor and that of the patient. So mm-hmm. can you explain uh, in some detail uh, how the program works? Uh, you mentioned diet. I know there's nutritional supplements. There's detoxification. Can you give us a little more detail of what patients need to comply with? Um, Sure. Well, first off, there is diet. And the diets that we offer, as I mentioned earlier, do range anywhere from almost completely vegetarian, although even with the the most plant-based diet, we would still recommend some eggs, um, some dairy if the patient tolerates it, um, some fish, um, just because those are easily used sources of protein. Um, But uh, the diets then can be primarily vegetarian all the way to meat um, three times a day. Um, What we do find is that in the vast majority of cases, the diet that's recommended is one that the patient um, feels fairly well on. In other words, Mm -hmm. some of your audience might be cringing at the thought of eating meat, but typically those people are more vegetarian anyway, um, whereas the people that I tell to eat meat, many times they'll look at me across the desk and it's as if I had told them that all their dreams had instantly come true and they tell me that they're dreaming of steak. Mm-hmm. Um, if if I were to eat like that, I would get sick, but it works for them. Um, mm-hmm. But any of the diets uh, would have in common that we would recommend organic food. We would recommend that people are doing the vast majority of their meal preparation at home for themselves uh, and whole foods, you know, whole grains, um, no white sugar, no white flour, no alcohol, um, in, in effect, cleaning up the diet. And for mm-hmm. some people, that's what they've already been trying to do for some people that is a a huge change you know they aren't in the habit of cooking for themselves Um, some of them it seems like don't even know how so you know Mm -hmm. that can be that can be a big deal 
secondly, as far as nutritional supplements go, um, the all of the patients that come to us take supplements with their meals, and those are designed um, partly to uh, strengthen the body overall, to help it repair in general, and also uh, we feel that the balance of calcium, magnesium, and potassium can help balance out the the physiology. Um, many of our patients who have the more vegetarian type of metabolism tend to have a, a the sympathetic nervous system the part of the autonomic nervous system that takes care of functions in the background, so to speak, like blood pressure or heart rate. Um, Their sympathetic fight-or-flight system can be very overactive, and the nutritional supplements can help tone that down using a lot of magnesium or potassium. Uh, So so that's part of what we're doing with with patients with the mealtime supplements. Um, But then also for patients with cancer, there are large amounts of pancreatic enzymes Now, the argument for pancreatic enzymes being used in cancer actually goes back a long way, well before Dr. Kelly, who discovered it for himself serendipitously. Um, Pancreatic enzymes in typical physiology and medicine are believed only to have a role in digesting food. And then Dr. Kelly tried them out because he was having terrible digestive problems when he was sick. But then he also started to take them in between meals, and he noticed that the character of the tumor that he had in his abdomen started to change. Um, And so based on that, he realized that pancreatic enzymes might play a role in fighting cancer. He then did a little more investigating and discovered the work of a a scientist named Dr. John Beard, who was an embryologist, and he lived, I believe he passed away in the 1920s, but the main period of scientific interest uh, in his work um, was from about 1905 to 1911, 1912, thereabouts. Um, Dr. Beard, being an embryologist, that meant that he was involved in studying the very early stage stages of development in humans and other animals as well. He actually did his PhD work on the de- development in fish. Um, but his interest that got him into cancer was the realization that uh, the embryo in its very early stages, when there's only a few cells involved, actually creates a tissue called the trophoblast. The job of the trophoblast is as the embryo enters the uterus as, and travels from the ovary and down the fallopian tube, it's called, into the uterus, the job of the trophoblast is to latch on to the inside of the uterus, grab hold, and form a connection. And what Beard realized was in those early stages, the trophoblast under the microscope looks a lot like a cancer because the trophoblast is intent on working its way into the tissue of the uterus, creating a new blood supply for itself, and tricking the mother's immune system into thinking that this is not a foreign entity, even though the trophoblast has the same genetic makeup as the baby, which is clearly different from the mother. Um, So a cancer also works in invading neighboring tissues, creating its own blood supply and tricking the immune system. Uh, But what Beard also noticed was that at a certain point in development, the trophoblast changes character and matures. And he felt that if he could find a signal um, for why that happened, that uh, he would potentially be uncovering the answer for cancer. And what he discovered was that that change happened when the baby started making pancreatic enzymes. Seven months before the baby was going to see a solid meal, the baby was making pancreatic enzymes. And so pancreatic enzymes were then tried for cancer in Beard's era um, with considerable success, but not 100%. Um, Beard felt because back then there was no refrigeration and the quality of the enzymes would vary wildly. And so there was a lot of back and forth about it. Um, And in the meantime, radiation came along and was billed as the easy, non-toxic answer to cancer for taking care of everything. Beard's Mm -hmm. work got swept under the carpet. And it took another 10 years or so for uh, physicians to realize that radiation wasn't an easy answer either. In fact, uh, many of the early pioneers 
course in radiation treatment, died of radiation poisoning themselves. Mm -hmm. Um, But by then, Beard's work had been pretty much lost. Uh, Various people have picked it up over the years um, since then, but Dr. Kelly is probably the the one that did so um, with the with the most uh, noise, so to speak, and then (laughs) Dr. Gonzalez and myself after him. Fascinating, fascinating. You know, it's so interesting. I just realized I I went off on a big tangent about enzymes and forgot about the third part, which is detoxification. But let me go ahead and let you know. No, that's okay. Sure. Sure. Um, Do you want to say anything in particular about detox? Well, uh, the main thing that we use is uh, coffee enemas, and those have actually been in the literature as a way to help make people feel better since the at least the 1860s. Uh, I did a, an article about coffee enemas a few years ago and actually was able to find an article from the 1890s where one of the Mayo brothers who founded the Mayo Clinic was talking about how critically important coffee enemas are in the post-operative period. Um, but Dr. Kelly had started using them because uh, what he would find as he took his enzymes to work on his cancer is that there would come a point where he would start to get a lot of flu-like symptoms that could become disabling. But he mm-hmm. found if he did coffee enemas and other and various other detoxification routines that that would help take care of those symptoms. So the three pieces then of our treatment, diet, supplements, which involve a lot of pancreatic enzymes as well as other things, and the coffee enemas and other detoxification routines. Mm-hmm. Well, um, and, and people are happy to talk about what's put in their mouth, but when you, when you talk about detoxification, people, don't, they shy away from that. It's not so comfortable. And, and yet I say, you know, God gave you only one mouth, but six or seven eliminatory organs, so clearly <laughs> the latter is more important. <laughs> well, that's um, true. And I, I can also say that nobody ever believes it, uh, but... Almost all of the patients come back in for their follow-up visit and say that the the coffee enemas are their absolute favorite part of the program. (laughs) Yeah, it doesn't sound like fun. Um, No, it doesn't. Most people are more comfortable. But people feel a lot better when they do them. Yeah, yeah. So, how many patients roughly have have you and Dr. Gonzalez seen uh, over the many years ballpark that Uh, you've actually worked with? Yeah, it's it's hard for me to say exactly because you know we've had periods where we were more busy, less busy, et cetera, and you know trying to generate overall statistics out of a clinical practice is very difficult because there's just so many variables. So we've tended to focus more on case reports. Um, having said that, uh, since I, um, I I double checked in the files I have available, and it it looks like in 2014 between the two of us, over the course of the year, we saw about 100 new patients and then, mm-hmm. of course, follow-up visits from other patients. Um, the way we operate is fairly time-intensive. In other words, sure. it takes me um, two sessions, each lasting two hours, to get started with a patient. And because everything is individualized, um, it uh, it's, a, it's a little bit more time-intensive. So we haven't treated you know thousands and thousands and thousands of patients by any means. Um, but over the course of the years, I, I, I honestly, I can't really say, because like I said, um, there were periods where we've been busy or less busy. Um, I, I have a hard time um, coming up with an absolute number for you. Well, I don't need an absolute number, but it's clear that you've got experience with many hundreds of patients. Oh, yeah. I, I would say more in the thousands, probably. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yes. Well, um, and and I guess you've seen some pretty impressive results. Um, yes, we certainly have. Um, and I, you know, I talked to you just a little while ago about my patient with pancreatic cancer, um, and that's certainly a, an impressive result. Um, just to give you another um, another story of a patient that I myself treated, a gentleman who in 1995 was diagnosed with a type of lymphoma, um, follicular lymphoma, uh, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma as it's called. And um, at the time that he was diagnosed, uh, he was found to have a tumor in his abdomen that was uh, measuring 
um, 15 centimeters across, which would work out to about seven inches. So he had mm-hmm. a five by seven inch tumor in his abdomen. And the reason they had found this in the first place, the reason they'd gone looking was because he had developed swelling in his lower abdomen and his feet um, because mm-hmm. this thing was putting pressure on various vessels. Um, so he came in and started the treatment. He never did any form of orthodox therapy whatsoever. And he did, did very well. Um, and he had another scan in May of 2001. So that would be about six years after he started. And at that point, everything had completely resolved. And he's had a few CAT scans over the years since then. Um, He still does parts of his program. I haven't actually physically seen him in quite a while. But uh, he, you know, proceeded from this diagnosis of his that, you know, could have well killed him. Um, He's proceeded since then to get better, to start a family, um, and has done very well over the years. So that's a a nice, straightforward case history of a gentleman who did very well. Um, Dr. Gonzalez and I had written and published an article that consists of case reports um, uh, a while back, and so the link for that is available from my website, but it includes um, a number of different patients um, who did extraordinarily well with this treatment. That's that's great. Um, um, Really, you know, it's hard work and uh, not every patient is going to follow this type of program, but it's wonderful to know with those that those with advanced disease really have a chance to fully resolve their situations. Now, I realize that you do quite an evaluation before you determine whether a patient is eligible for this type of program. So can, can you explain the appropriateness or lack thereof uh, of your program for certain patients? Do you accept patients who have been previously treated? What are some of the criteria that you use? Um, Well, when a patient is interested in pursuing this treatment, we ask them to send in some information, and it's all broken down on my website, um, what we would like them to send in. Um, Some of the characteristics that would make this not the best choice for a particular patient would include, you know, for instance, if they're so sick that they can't eat, well, then taking Mm -hmm. 200 supplements is just not going to, 200 capsules per day is just not going to happen. So if they're unable to eat, if they're nauseated all the time, um, those things cause, that's that's a problem we can't we can't do anything about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, other issues, you know, if, if somebody reports dramatic weight loss, then that would suggest that they're not eating as well. Um, mm-hmm. You know, there are some things that, you know, I almost hesitate to say just because, you know, one thing I would encourage your listeners is, you know, don't don't fudge the truth in what you tell me because that's not helping anybody really. And, you know, smoking, for example, you can't actively smoke and also try to do a program like this. It just doesn't make sense because Mm -hmm. a big part of what we're trying to do is detoxify the body. And, uh, if you're, if your your situation is such that you have to bring in extra toxins all the time, that's not going to work very well. Um, beyond that, uh, you know, it starts to get into a case-by-case assessment. Um, of course. There are, and there are um, cases where people have too much involvement, you know, they're just simply too sick. Um, and cases also where, you know, if a patient isn't really, you know, if this doesn't make sense to them, then this isn't the direction they should go. No, of course um, not. Yeah, and people, but people sometimes, in effect, want me to talk them into the treatment, and that that doesn't make sense. You know, I I can't move in. You know, I can't go home with them and encourage them every day like that. And you know, if they're not, if if it doesn't make sense to them, they shouldn't do it. Um, and then finally, a, a, another big one that surprises a lot of people sometimes, I think, is that if there's a curative option and standard treatment, um, that's what I think people should do, because um, this is not an easy program to follow. And so if 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 standard medicine offers them a cure, I'm going to tell them so, um, and I think that's something that they should seriously consider. Mm-hmm. Now, if a patient has been in the past um, on chemo or radiation. Is that a reason not to be a candidate? 
It really depends on the diagnosis. Um, for some things like uh, pancreatic cancer actually is one example. Um, for that particular illness, if somebody's already gotten chemotherapy or radiation, then they've already gotten a significant amount of damage to a critical area of their body from the treatment as well as from the disease. And our practical experience is that those patients just don't do well. They don't get the results mm-hmm. that they were hoping for when they came to the office. And so so, uh, so under those that setting, um, I would not encourage them to do this kind of approach. Uh, but there are other conditions, like for instance, with breast cancer. You know, it's it's fairly verging on routine these days that after people get their uh, their surgical procedure, they might get chemotherapy or radiation, and that is not something that's impossible um, to deal with. So, mm-hmm. um, so and it then, really but, depends, bottom line. But I'm going to imagine that if a patient is currently undergoing treatment, that would not be a good match. That's correct. Um, you know, there's a, a lot of concerns on, in the oncology world about whether nutritional supplementation can interfere with what they're trying to do. And also, from my point of view, um, if you're trying to do multiple treatments at once, um, then anytime you have any kind of a problem, nobody will know why. There'll be a confusion mm-hmm. of why are you having a side effect or an issue. Um, and it just makes life very challenging. You know, there, mm-hmm. there are certainly doctors out there that specialize in nutritional uh, advice for people that are currently undergoing chemotherapy mm-hmm. and radiation. And I would just suggest that somebody that's looking for that should seek out one of those types of practitioners instead. Right. Um, that makes sense. And um, as someone who runs a referral service, those are some of the criteria that I have in general used before I dangle a carrot. And of course, as you say, you're going to make the case-by-case assessment. Mm -hmm. But I tell patients in advance, if you are turned down for this program, it is probably in your best interest to look elsewhere. It is not that you just had rotten luck. Um, And what is the approximate cost to patients? Because that also could be a factor um, why patients might not be able to choose this type of program. Right, sure. Well, the biggest cost to the patients over the course of the treatment, which is a lifestyle change, in other words, it's not something that you do for a month or two and then stop, um, This the, the supplements will run for a cancer patient in the neighborhood of $900 a month. And um, for, for most people, that well, that is the, the long-term expense. Um, when you throw in, you know, just because we spend so much time with people, the initial appointments um, are, uh, you know, that that runs $4,500 right now. So for the initial year on a, on the program, um, a patient might be spending in the neighborhood of sixteen or $17,000, um, less than that going forward because, you know, once, once somebody's been instructed and knows what to do, they don't have to come in as often or, as, or for as long a period. But the, the supplement cost is the big cost, and there's nothing thing I can do about that. Um, the the supplement cost uh, is based on, you know, the supplement company that we use, and I don't own them and I don't make any money from them, but uh, it's, it's, you know, it is what it is. Uh, you know, there's multiple steps involved in the processing and encapsulation of supplements and, and um, all that costs money. Mm-hmm. And there are a lot of supplements that they take. Uh, it could right. be up to what a hundred or more per day? Supplements? Oh, it's definitely more for a cancer patient. It's more like uh, in the neighborhood of 150 to 200. Hmm. Um, so that's a lot. And and for patients who just can't do that, even if they're eating, then the program's not for them. That's right. That's so right. so, um, Dr. Isaacs, let's uh, give our listeners your website and how and and let them understand how they can learn more about what you do and how you can how you can be reached my website address is 
drlindai.com. So that's D-R, Linda, L-I-N-D-A, and then the first letter of my last name, I, Isaacs. So it's drlindai.com. And if they look there, they'll find my phone. The office phone number here is 212-213-3337. I will say, though, that my staff will just wind up sending you back to the website. So that is where I would suggest that you start. Um, and what you'll find there is a little bit more about me, some articles and things that I've written, um, some directions for what to do if you want to become a patient, and uh, the step-by-step process uh, to send in your information. So I can review it and see see whether I think I can be of help. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, and as a final word, if I may speak for both of us, uh, I, I want our listeners to know that neither Dr. Isaacs nor I want patients who uh, who may not be appropriate for Dr. Isaacs' program or uh, who can af- not afford the program. We don't want any of those people to feel that they cannot get well because there are still many, many options out there for people with cancer. Uh, And so uh, feel free to contact our organization, toll free 888-551-2223 or one of our counselors through the beatcancer.org website. We're happy to set up an appointment for a consultation. Again, we are educators, not clinicians, but we can help a great deal as well. Dr. Isaacs, I want to thank you for your time, for your commitment to this wonderful work. Uh, And uh, I just hope that our paths will cross many times in the future. Well, I really appreciate this opportunity to speak with you, and I, I certainly would also encourage your listeners to, you know, put into practice everything that they can and and uh, take advantage of the opportunities that uh, you all are offering through your great work. Um, I do believe that uh, nutrition alone can can offer great things, and um, I, again, I'm just very happy to have had the opportunity to speak with you and your audience. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you so much for joining us on the Beat Cancer Answer. If you learned just one thing today about how to prevent, cope with, or beat cancer, then we have succeeded in our mission. For more information or assistance, visit our website at beatcancer.org. Remember to sign up for our educational email series and get your free gift. Join in the conversation on Facebook, Twitter, or Google+, where you can meet others who think just like you. We appreciate all of your feedback and love your suggestions. Please also remember to rate us on iTunes. Your positive ratings help us to get discovered so we can save more lives. Thank you again for listening and best wishes for good health from all of us at BeatCancer.org.